Get out of here. Welcome. <laughs> We're covering the news. <laughs> Today's news from underground. Uh, well, welcome to your place in the internet for anarchist uh, consistent news and covers of any kind of topics you may suggest in the comments below. Uh, today, I want to welcome our uh, returning co-host, Rachel, and uh, tell us a little bit what you're into or your likes and dislikes or whatnot. So let's see. I'm a... Uh a gainfully employed art major agorist. Um, you know, I can drive a nail better than Bernie Sanders, apparently. And, uh, let's That's not see. saying much. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I have a healthy, morbid fascination with um, uh, what makes people contemplate their own mortality. That's the basis for the purpose of most art. So I'm really going to thrive on today's blight-ridden episode because we have three topics. We have one parasite and two viruses. Yay! <laughs> Vicious. And before I talk about the first parasite, uh, come on by anytime to pick up your Anarchy L and your Liberate RVA Porter. Remember, these are not for sale for free of currency. So come on by at the uh, Liberty Hangouts. We usually on uh, every Thursday. And uh, or during the Freedom Gardens or any time outside of that, you know, send us a message at operations at info at uh, liberatervda.com. Mm. Uh, it may repel intestinal parasites. All right, <laughs> stay liberated, my friends. And uh, we're going to talk about the first parasite, Bernie Sanders. Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders said Monday his parents would never have thought their son would end up in the Senate and running for president. No kidding, it was a newer duel, well into his late thirties. So I found an interesting article out there that kind of puts together like the facts and the infos and people who he'd grown up with, his friends and his, his, his parents, and kind of putting together a picture of Bernie Sanders before he came, he came to be on stage recently. Uh, so, you know, background, his family sent him to uh, University of Chicago. Uh, it took him 40 years, though, after that, after he achieved his uh, degree in political science, right, political pseudoscience, though, uh, to finally collect his first steady paycheck when he was elected mayor. <laughs> so it was, it was a government paycheck. So it's not to say, though, he really did get a job still, and it's still a welfare position. Uh, it's just never really worked a day in his life uh, in that standard of which uh, you can bring in Karl Marx <laughs> never worked a day in his life, never toiled in the factories, uh, never had his hands dirty or got on his knees or clean up any, even much after himself. They were so afraid. Uh, he sponge off his friends, uh, rich aristocrats, uh, off his wife who had a live-in maid, you know, or someone who uh, talked about exploitation, he exploited. Still talking about Marx here. So, yes, yeah, so, well, it's it a better Bernie story. <laughs> So well, I'm pretty thing. sure Bernie is the uh, the reincarnation of Marx anyway, so... Right? <laughs> I'm reading this guy's background and seeing Karl Marx is finding excuses to justify why he's not getting a job or getting work. Well, yeah, Engels was Engels was a, uh, a rich uh, businessman, wasn't he? Or, he was, was, yes. Yeah. 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 His so. father uh, bestowed him uh, many gifts of wealth mm -hmm. and to continue running a business. Uh, so, and, and Bernie Sanders here says, he says, uh, I never had any money in my entire life. And uh, he told this to uh, Vermont Public TV in 1985 after settling in his uh, first rear job again as mayor of Burlington. Burlington. Uh, which I'm going to skip to that at this one point, which is hilarious. <laughs> so Richmond has a sister city, I think. Uh, or, or I always thought it was across. Portland. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but Portland has a sister city too, and it's uh, someplace in, in Japan. Mm. Uh, so Portland has like this enormous rose garden. There's another place in Japan that also has enormous rose gardens. And, and a whole so, lot of Japanese people wearing thick rimmed glasses and beards. Right. <laughs> oh my god, I've been there. It's the Rosa Parks rose gardens. Yeah, yeah. okay, all right, so there you go. All right. <laughs> um, Some lovely lifestylers I know were married there. All so. right. Uh, great pictures from that. The uh, so the cities can have sister cities. I guess it just takes somebody to kind of declare it, decree it. Same thing, rivalry. Right. Yeah. Bernie Sanders did the same thing. <laughs> when people are talking about, well, he's not a communist. It's just uh, democratic socialism. Well, we're just you know taking away all your property. All your property are belong to us. Apparently, uh, when he was mayor, he hung a Soviet flag in honor of Burlington's Soviet sister city. Well, uh, Yaroslav. Yeah. 
Yaroslav? Yeah, Yaroslav. Looks right to me. And yeah. this was still during the Cold War, by the looks of it. That was before 89, yeah? Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Reagan era. Soviet, yeah. you know, so. Look at 160 miles northeast of Moscow. Praise the gulag. Right. <laughs> what that? That's not a communist flag. That's a democratic socialism. That's not fascism. That's just a National Socialist Party, Workers' Party of Germany. Uh, so, you know, after that, he, uh, he got married. And uh, I guess she, I don't know, it seems that uh, she didn't really much know the guy because uh, moving into his, his, moving his bride into his new home that they uh, lived in together, it was a maple shack, sugar shack with a dirt floor apparently. And then she soon now was- Easy rider in a sugar shack, okay. Yeah, so he, she left him because he wouldn't get a job. Uh, he was just uh, trying miserably at different, different things, odd things, carpentry, as uh, the printing joke was earlier. And his friends would say, yeah, he was a shitty carpenter. Um, Hey, this is somebody kind of... Well, you know, you mean work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no problem with people trying to try entrepreneurial stuff. I'm going to try business in this. I'm going to try this endeavor. Yeah, but uh, don't do it at the expense of which your, your life is kind of suffering from there. Um, you know, pick up after yourself. Uh, get yourself a steady job and work in some experimental stuff on the side. But that's not what this guy did. Uh, so, he, penniless, he went on unemployment. Then he had a child out of wedlock. Um... Yeah, it's just a whole mess of a life of this guy who, very reminiscent when I look at it, I see car marks in there, trying to create excuses and justifications for his lifestyle. Here's one with socialism, in which I'm uh, really into, means I really don't have to work, all right? Damn the role that, uh, that I, have to, I have to get out of bed, that I have to create a, maybe a trade so I could exchange things for, from other people and goods. Um, well, he lived his life according to the life of his idol. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's very true. But then this is this is what I the thing I really love about Bernie Sanders is is every every you know pretty much every dime he's made is through being a career politician. But he has become this this bulwark in, in the political sphere by being a political outsider somehow. Even though he is the definition of a career politician. All right. How does that happen? I mean, how how do people actually look at this? Like, it, it fall for that crap. Well, he has all the trappings of you know, caring society's wet dream. I mean, instead of a, a manifesto, he released a folk rock album. You know, he he talks with the you know like intelligentsia cadence in his voice. You know, he can like people can say he can talk you to death. That's what he has going for him. You know, so he he learned all the right things to say. You know, and. Were I, you know, following my parents' ideals, I would be very excited about Bernie. Right. But, you know, <laughs> thankfully, I realized where their misery came from. And I can see this for the, you know, as you say, the career politician sham it is. Even more so because, as you're about to tell us, he found a way to have steady and dependable income by claiming not one, but two government pensions now. You know, for right. the <laughs> Yeah, so he's, he's a career uh, welfare veteran. <laughs> income, in, in, we all know that income is only valid if it's gained at the point of the gun. Right. And uh, for some people out there who are still thinking about uh, Go Bernie, uh, this guy's awesome. Uh, well, you know, he, people say he, he voted against the war, but he did vote to fund it. He did vote to fund the Iraq and Afghanistan war in June 26, 2008. And so... Sometimes people will say, I remember having this little argument on the internet for a second, and someone said, well, you know, what, what politician uh, wasn't a advocating for the war? I said, well, there we go, right? So it's, why are you doing supporting any of these people then, <laughs> these warmongers, and at any point, at any conjecture? Uh, some of them, go ahead. I think he actually voted for every, uh, every NDAA bill up until like 2012, too. So it, it's not like he's been consistently voting to defund the, defen the defense, you know, um, establishment. All right. I mean, he has been, by and large, you know, pretty positive towards them. Yeah. And I, I think probably the reason why he started uh, voting against funding the NDA, uh, NDAA, is because of political reasons. And this is what happens when uh, you get involved with politics. You start compromising your principles. Uh, and so, yeah, what do you expect? This is this is. 
the very nature of all political rulers, uh, the very nature of uh, their very being is declaring war on humanity. It is but if war he has Soviet sensibilities, he wouldn't really mind an arms race. You know, that's how you maintain peace. But um, just to throw right. that in there, it's not that <laughs> counter to what he's exhibited. I before. would also point out, it, I, I would point this out in both the Soviet case and in the case of Bernie Sanders, having an ideology does not necessarily mean you have principles. And Bernie Sanders has, you know, Bernie Sanders has an ideology. I frankly don't think he's ever had principles. I agree. I agree. Um, principle, yeah, I agree. The only thing that's been consistent is this continued advocation that's other people's fault, always railing and against capitalism and uh, and nothing towards uh, self in terms of this. I guess eternal victimhood is what he's, his praises in right. that regards and, and chairs and values and upholds. Um, yes. <laughs> right. With that particular bill, though, that he voted to fund, uh, some people say, well, you know, you got to, you know, they included uh, unemployment benefit extensions and for a GI bill and whatnot. It's like, well, yeah, this goes back again. Like, like no one uh, should be entitled to anything. It's, through, through government, you enslave other people to provide these sort of things, uh, regardless of your uh, welfare veteran of another nature from the military as well. Uh, but even still, then, uh, that would mean that... Uh, well, he cares about the veterans. He cares about these people who are, who are troubled and who are homeless. It's like, well, then you don't. You still don't fund a war that will bring back even more of these troubled people. Then uh, that's uh, that's not putting. Sticks what we Yeah. <laughs> well, I just I, I just love the whole concept of we 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 send these guys over to voluntarily kill and murder people for the you know America. We owe them. <laughs> yeah. We owe them help and, and, you know, assistance with their injuries that they got from being psychopathic murderers. All right. So, yeah, don't, don't, don't be fooled. <laughs> this guy's as worse as they come. Um, and this, he doesn't really hide it. It's his whole entire, uh, I think it was part of like uh, the Socialist Party of, of America in terms of his uh, activism and being involved with like, um, like the people's youth, Republic of Youth or something like that. Uh, this is a little kind of, uh, I guess, Stalin youth groups. Is that the disturbed be. youngsters he spoke of when he cited his major forms of income? <laughs> <That's me. laughs> He's still getting most of his money from disturbed youngsters. Right, he owns no he assets. His financial statements uh, point out that it belongs to his second wife. Hmm. Um, so yeah, interesting. But sometimes this kind of troubles me with some people who uh, on the opposite end of that, uh, talk about how great capitalism is by showing you how not good they are in their own lives. Um, and that's, uh, I don't know, practice what you preach, right? Well, that's really, that's the core of both Marx and Bernie. You know, I suck at life, therefore you owe me money. All right. And to justify that. Mm-hmm. And that's always what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what, where, why do they go that direction? What's the justification for supporting that or having that reason? And trying to pick that apart. Uh, so there we go. Your parasite. Uh, some more interesting, horrific news out there. Oh. Okay. Well, more so on the topic of people want to spend more time arguing while you need something than actually, you know, quantifying why you need something. We had Dan Smith jailed for not having a Gatineau license for a cat. Um, this was in Canada? French Canada? Yeah, okay. Um, so I may be pronouncing these French derivative place names horribly wrong. For a cat that he says isn't even his, the 65 year old retired refrigerator technician, because you need refrigerators in Canada, not nar, arrived at the Gatineau police station around 10 a.m. I want to get this over with, said Smith. I'm turning myself in. Smith told a woman at the front desk of the station, I'm surrendering. And from there, he found that the fines had been steadily increased because of the amount of time he took to respond. So the money was more than he expected it to be. When he actually asked how much jail time he would have to exchange for his fines, though, he found out it had to be three days, which was less than he expected in that case. However, he is a... 65-year-old man with chronic arthritis, you know, there are issues that come with this. And in the meantime, of course, you know, who's feeding this cat that they're worried about him having ownership of, which um, in all honesty smacks of the uh, Ferguson Catch-22, you know, if you really are 
hauling people into jail for not, you know, looking after the things you feel they should be looking after, and your evidence that they are not fulfilling these duties is that you're not buying their services. And then, because you're not buying their services, you put them in jail. Who exactly are you helping? Um, Smith um, says the cat was owned by his ex, well, fed by his ex-wife. It wasn't actually owned by anything. And despite his, you know, he doesn't really um, say his opinions on the ex-wife, but he tells that he doesn't bear the cat any ill will. He realizes this is not the cat's fault. He doesn't feel, he does not push blame upon, you know, the creature he was trying to lend assistance to. Or his wife, his ex-wife was trying to lend assistance to. Um, I just want to know, with, you know, the sort of life situation this man is in where he's no longer living with the person who supposedly fed the cat. In fact, he's moved into a post-divorce apartment outside of the city in a neighboring town. Who reported him? You know, where are these pussy police? This like, is Gustavo. Yeah, exactly, you know. <laughs> Um, here in the city of Richmond, I've owned cats for over seven years now, and only this past year have I been compelled to get a separate city-based license for them. And mind you, in the meantime, I've always got my cats inoculated for rabies, because rabies is terrifying and terrible and a miserable way to die, and it can spread quickly in highly populated areas, you know. I'm suitably afraid of rabies. But that rabies um, tag that your vet office gives you has the vet's office contact number, and it's a clear and present symbol that your cat or dog is of no immediate danger. I mean, if, if you guys saw something with an a rabies, a rabies vaccine with the year it's good through stamped on it, you'd be like, that animal isn't going to kill you. But I hope it's going to be too late because I have to get really close to the animal. Well, it, it's hanging there around <laughs> its neck, you know, and, you know, if an animal does bite you, you have that frame of reference of, do I need to go and have the injections done or all mm -hmm. that shit? And, you know, it's a reassuring thing. Plus, when my cat wandered into a neighbor's house and they're like, where is this cat? Where did it come from? It needs to go away. They called the vet's office and the vet's office called me. And I was like, oh, it lives down the block. Pick it out, you know? Because right. <laughs> yeah. that's naturally a homestead, entire large geographic areas as part of their territory. Exactly, yeah. They, they got to <laughs> pee on shit. All but right. anyway, the only thing the uh, Richmond government seems to be stressing beyond that is in emergency situations like hurricanes and whatnot that um, we can return your pet to you, you know? And honestly, if I remember correctly, um, down in New Orleans, a lot of private organizations stepped into rehome pets. So, I mean, I might be going off top of it here, but the one thing the city of Richmond really seems to be stressing is a benefit for, for this service that I've already been provided is something that they wouldn't really be handling anyway. But anyway, yeah, um, one could, I guess, argue that if you're having to pay this superfluous fee, which, you know, I didn't volunteer my pet ownership information to the city, so the vet's office must have had to. Hmm. If the vet's office is going to report you, are people no longer going to have their pets vaccinated because they know they'll be tracked and given an annual stipend. Right. You only have to have rabies vaccines done every three years, rabies boosters. This is every frigging year on every frigging pet that you own. Uh, well, I could, uh, we can give them a call, find out. Who's your, are you guys reporting us? Is this what's going on? <laughs> no, I'll say right. I mean, the, uh, the, the Veterinary Association is another kind of cartel. Um, remember we were talking about a while ago about these horses and the veterinary uh, association was uh, punishing and fining um, these people who are providing grooming services for horses. Um, I don't know, that would be interesting to kind of check out and see how affiliated are they. So do they turn up uh, information <laughs> on request or voluntarily or are they passing that out? And if so, why can't they just write fake information? You know, go ahead. Well, you know, deliver it to this address, X, Y, and Z. Because it's not like it's something you can't trust people to do the right thing in most cases. If you have pets, you care about them. And I suppose the state knows that because this seems an easy way to suddenly tack on a new revenue fee. Like, you, you love your pets, you know, you don't want them to die. Pay us more money, you know. They're, mm -hmm. your, it's, they're your child surrogates, which in its way could be a penalty, you know, for people who are choosing to have pets instead of have children because, you know, it, it always benefits the state if you have a couple unpregnant pregnancies, but there's not really much the government can do with my cats. Mm -hmm. They don't follow orders, you know. They can't be indoctrinated by their school system. Exactly. <laughs> On the other hand, severely mentally disabled children might be able to, which segues nicely into the, uh, the uh, malady that Philip is going to talk about. Yeah, so uh, we're going back to my home state. Uh, that's right. If you read about Florida, man, that's me. But uh, Governor Rick Scott declares Zika emergency in four counties. 
Governor Rick Scott declared a health emergency in four counties Wednesday after at least nine cases of the mosquito-borne Zika illness were detected in Florida. Health officials believe none of the cases originated in Florida. All involve people who contracted the disease while traveling to affected countries, they say. Scott signed the order to cover Miami-Dade, Lee, Hillsborough, and Santa Rosa counties. That's where all of the cases were detected. So, um, this actually two of these counties I have lived in, Miami-Dade and Lee County, I've, I've both uh, lived there. And it's kind of ridiculous that, uh, that he's doing this because um, there isn't a whole lot of international traffic through Lee County. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't really know about Santa Rosa County, but I, I would bet there's probably not a whole lot there. And since all of these, these cases are um, international travel cases, they are not people that contracted this illness in Florida, you know, why is he going hot crazy about this in, in these places? So um, one, one thing that we need to know about the Zika virus, so it's, um, it has a possible link to birth defects, and it's, uh, it's called microcephaly in newborns. It's, it's the, uh, the pinhead, I think mm -hmm. they call it, mm -hmm. disease. And, um, but, but this link hasn't actually been, um, been confirmed. So they, they don't actually even know if this is true. And if it is true, it's basically, you know, if you have the Zika virus while you're pregnant, you know, and I, I think they said that, uh, generally if, if, you know, if you've got the Zika virus, then you're good, you know, like two years later. So the actual likelihood of you getting the Zika virus when you're pregnant is, is, is pretty unlikely. Um, now what catches me about this is you, you would think that he would call a state of emergency in the, um, in the parts of Florida that have a lot of international travel. So Miami-Dade County is, there's an, a, a lot of international uh, traffic through Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent there is in Tampa. But Lee County, not so much. And, you know, if he's going to do something like this, you'd think he'd do something in, in Orange and uh, uh, Orange County, which is uh, Orlando. That's the Orlando International Airport. Uh, airport. And that's, uh, you know, where everybody is going through to go to Disney. Right. Yeah. But... Uh, For universals. Right. So uh, I, I, think, I think a lot of skepticism is warranted here. So this, to me, reeks of, of both the Ebola scare and the swine flu scare. Both of these were, were situations where the media and the government tried to get everybody really terrified about this, oh my God, we're all gonna get Ebola because a few people in, in Texas has it. Well, there is only one case of Zika virus actually being caught in the United States, and it's not from mosquitoes, it was from a, um, well, it's thought to have been a, um, from a sexually transmitted uh, case. And this was in Texas. It wasn't in Florida. Now, Zika is actually, it's actually spread through, um, uh, there's only one mosquito, one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, one breed of mosquito that is known to spread this virus. And it is fairly common in, in Florida. It's not the most common by any means, but uh, it is uh, spread through all of Florida. But there is not a single case of mosquito-borne Zika virus in Florida. So, like, you know, actually caught in Florida by mosquito by Floridian mosquitoes. So, I think calling a state of emergency in Florida, uh, even in these, these counties where these nine cases in Florida, which is the third most populated state in America, I think this is overkill and fear monitoring. What are the, uh, okay, fear monitoring is good, yeah. What are the uh, net gains for them? For monitoring, they always good. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think this very likely could be a because he's he's he is literally calling a state of medical emergency in these counties. So this this is very likely a pretext for um, you know power grabbing. You know, back in in the uh, in the swine flu situation, the, the the governments were actually I think some governments were actually trying to to um, have forced vaccinations for the swine flu. And of course, the swine flu, in the entire, you know, over like five years where swine flu was, was you know, touted as being a thing, 
it infected and it, or it had a death rate and an infection rate less than regular influenza has in every year. Mm-hmm. You know, regular influenza kills more people every year than swine flu does. And the fact is, if you get if you get the flu or the swine flu in America or in you know industrialized nations where we have you know uh, sufficient medical medical care. Uh, medical treatment and stuff like that. Chances that you're going to be that you're going to die are virtually zero, and it's the same with this. So Zika, Zika actually has very few serious side effects. The likelihood that you're actually going to get a serious case, uh, a serious issue from Zika, is very low. the The actual symptoms of Zika are like like basic flu symptoms, like mm-hmm. mild flu symptoms. So. I, I really do think, I, I think it's just... Can't they also then, uh, like, command more federal funding, right? Federal stolen property when that oh, yeah. happens, right? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll call for that. Yeah, uh, pretext for that. Um, hmm. Well, as I understand, mosquitoes are already a huge business in Florida. I mean, if, if they're to take this from a public health standpoint, the way they took, you know... Um, drug testing and welfare from a public standpoint in Florida and made, you know, a bad situation much worse. That could explain why they're... Also Rick Scott, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it kind of feels the same way. Like, they're focusing, as you say, not on the areas where legitimate, documented human um, transport and, you know, incoming from other parts of the world would be something they could quantify and track. Instead, they're looking into the rural areas. They're looking where, you know the outbreaks might be because that's where people who, for whatever reason, can't seek out the most readily available services. You know, well, if you've got undocumented people, you know, if you've got people who who simply can't afford treatment, yeah, it's going to break out there first. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand, there's, well, everywhere in the U.S., but there's a huge poverty margin along coastal Florida as compared to inland Florida. So, I mean, that could just be hedging your bets as well, to... Well, a lot of, uh, so the, the most, um, a lot of the undocumented workers are actually in inland Florida because they're 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 doing uh, farming like sugarcane farming mm-hmm. and stuff like that um, now it also to clarify the these counties um, I don't really know anything about Santa Rosa County mm-hmm. I, I, I want to say that's that's close to it's sort of close to Gainesville but I, I really don't know um, but the the other counties are not uh, rural by any means they are they are, so fairly are they like suburbs like so um, Lee County mm-hmm. is 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 not Overly, I mean, that's where Fort Myers is. That's where I used to. That's actually where I went to high school, and um, it's you know it's fairly developed. It, so it's not, it's not you know super rural either. Hillsborough County is Tampa. That's so that's very you know that's very city, very urban. Miami Dade County, that's Miami. So that's like the entire. It used to be called Dade County. Now it's called Miami Dade County because Miami has pretty much swallowed the entire county. So Miami Dade County is very urban. So are they following the money and just the people who most consistently pay taxes? Well, well, that's the thing is is so Rick Scott says says he's doing this to as a um, as so Rick Scott says he's doing this to to sort of stave off you know as a preemptive strike basically against possible you know. You said um, he's done this before, right? uh, Not I don't I don't know if he's done anything like this before. I'm sure he has, but. but, but anyway, what he's doing is he, he says he's doing this as sort of a preemptive strike uh, to stave off a possible you know explosion of, of Zika virus. But he's only going after the counties where these nine cases happened, and that that's why he's going after these these four counties because that that's where these these you know that's where they cropped up. But the fact is, if you're actually going, if you're doing this as a strategic attack, you know, preemptive you know, way to, uh, to attack this disease, you would be going after the, the international travel hubs, which would be Miami-Dade County, that's good, Tampa, Hillsborough County, that's also good, St. Petersburg, which is um, Pin- Pinellas County, I want to say. Um, but you would also be going to o- Orange County, Seminole County, and Osceola County, Phil, or Disney Phil. World. That would, that would make sense. That would make sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But you know what? What can you expect from the governor whose name to fame is bringing Wawa to the state? <laughs> I mean, did it, I, right? I like how he tries to get all the credit for it. Yeah. No, we brought. Well, he, I mean, he signed some. 
I'm pretty sure he signed some sort of, you know, cronyist bill. Yeah, but out of the way, the Pidwa was there a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and the plentiful. Yeah. Uh, but I'll take credit for it. He's not even there building it. Yeah, but he's the jobs builder. Yeah. <laughs> Minimum wage jobs builder. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I could see some of this being kind of pretext in the future for like family camps and such. And people have seen camps out there just sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily buy the whole, that, that angle to it. Um, this is, I, I think this... No, like, I'm not saying like this in particular. This doesn't right. seem as strong. Well, even the happen. FEMA camp thing, like I've seen that, I, I've seen the footage of the FEMA camps right. and, the, and the, the so-called coffins that... Have you heard the joke? No. Your mama said status is sent to the FEMA camp for the summer. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Camp yeah. Rufugi. <laughs> but I, I think there are a lot, a lot of other. I don't know. I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I, I, I can see why people would go there, you know, with that. But I think it's a little bit of a stretch. As far as this goes, I, I would go back to your other point. I, I think it's you know probably a funding grab, a political move to make him look like you know he's strong against disease or, or whatever. I'm your superhero. And, yeah. <laughs> I'll save off the boogeyman. There's yeah. really no boogeyman, but you get the fear out there and make people believe it. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm almost certain that he, will, that he and the Florida legislature will probably use this little scare to pass through some sort of re- Sneak you know, power grab legislation. Yeah. So, so keep an eye on the Florida House, on the Florida Senate, and on, on the governor, what, what they're actually doing over the next few weeks. Because I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they try to pass some, some obnoxious, you know, crony legislation. That's very true. They, a lot, they use a lot of the um, big events in the world sometimes to just sneak things in there. Right. Like, uh, you look over New Year's, survive everyone's partying and drunk, see what kind of legislation that's, that's not passed there. Uh, I call it Ted, the Ted Offensive bills because <laughs> that's what ended up happening. And, uh, and the Ted Offensive, people are celebrating. It's a, it's a celebration. It's a holiday. And then that's where they got attacked. And, uh, yeah. That's how well, Bolivia lost the war, too. They're all drinking, celebrating. <laughs> it's holiday. There goes your coastline. <laughs> and they got attacked. <laughs> Oh, um, damn, somebody's tagging. <laughs> Let me sleep this off first. It's not celebrating it prematurely. <laughs> you think it'd be dangerous to attack Bolivians while drunk, but no. Right? <laughs> uh, so, these are your news stories. And uh, I'd like to segue again. You know, come by and uh, pick up your Anarchy L and Liberty RV Porter. They're delicious. Uh, <laughs> Liberty never tasted so good. And thank you for watching. This is Cal Mullen. Bill Bill Pollard. Rachel Lynn. See you guys at Victor Party. Take good care. Yeah.